Good afternoon. My name is Janessa Jackdale. I'm Tarek Glenn. I am Anushka Jackdale. First things first, please remember to turn off all cell phones and pagers. As well, there will be absolutely no flash photography, audio or video recording. As students at the University of North Carolina at Asheville, we would like to welcome the community members to the university. We would, and all of you, faculty, staff, students, and community to this event. The three of us are executive members of the Black Student Association. And to all of us, as I am sure it is to many of you, the month of February signifies more than snow and ice. Indeed, it is the month of black history. Some of the events that will be taking place this month include an exhibition by another African-American artist who's in the audience, Harry Davis, will be on display 2 to 8 p.m. today and also tomorrow from 1130 to 530 p.m. in UNCA's Laurel Forum. Joanne McKnight will hold a book signing and reception at 7 p.m. Friday, February 13th in UNCA's Reuters Center. Noted African-American painter Tarleton Blackwell currently has paintings on display at the main floor of the Ramsey Library. And of course, our keynote address by Mr. Julian Bond. BSA is a student-run organization that is devoted to the uplifting and wellness of black students here on campus. We plan a variety of events and activities for the campus. All students are welcome to join our organization. As black students at UNCA, we feel that it is essential for all of you to understand why Julian Bond is here. BSA's former president, Winston Rose, was instrumental in starting efforts to bring Mr. Bond here because he knows that as a group, we are unsatisfied. As UNCA continues its struggle to have a diverse campus, we've made a huge step by bringing Mr. Julian Bond here, but it's only one of many steps that we must take that we must take to bring diversity here on campus. As a community, we must continue our efforts and realize that although we've made some progress, we still have a long way to go in reaching our goals. These goals can be reached with, the, with persistence and with the help of everyone. We are told that things will get better in time, but the time has passed and now we must catch up. We can wait no longer and we need your help. Every person who is a member of this campus must help in making this university become what it was meant to be a true liberal arts institution. Dr. Dwight Mullen and Dr. James H. Mullen Jr. are both committed to this goal. Dr. Dwight Mullen, who will moderate our question and answer session, is the Director of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. Chancellor Mullen is a native of Holyoke, Massachusetts. He earned a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government in 1984 and a doctorate in higher education from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 1994. He and his wife Mary Mullen, who has been tremendous help today, have two young children, Mary Francis and James Charles. Please welcome Chancellor Mullen. Thank you very much, and good morning. It is a privilege for me to welcome our Board of Trustees, our Foundation Board, colleague, faculty, and staff, students, most importantly, and in a special way, our community to this very important event at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. This is your university, a place where significant conversations can and must occur about the vital issues of our time, a place where debate and dialogue and discussion give life to the liberal arts. I want to offer special thanks today to the Black Student Association, to Nucleus, to Dwight Mullen, to Deidre Wiggins for their work to make today a reality, and in a special way to Bunny Halton, who coordinated this very, very significant day. And if I might, I would like to direct my brief introduction, particularly to the students who are in attendance today. You are about to meet a man who is not only an important figure in American history, but a man who has made and continues to make history in our nation. A man who has embraced a cause and helped to make it a movement. Be it as founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as a state legislator in Georgia, as president of the Southern Poverty Law Center, as a distinguished member of the faculty at American University and the University of Virginia, as author, lecturer, or as chair of the NAACP, Julian Bond's life is vivid testimony 
that one individual whose voice is loud and clear and strong can make a difference. That one individual who is ready to sacrifice life's easy path can effect change. That one individual who brings passion and conviction to the struggle for human dignity and social justice can make the world a better place. You who are students here today hold within you the promise of such a life. A life made rich because you have touched history and shaped its course. Our guest today, in the extraordinary measure of his life's achievement, achievement born in the restless pursuit of social justice, and achievement that continues today in the relentless pursuit of human dignity, offers the most eloquent testimony that you, each and every one of you, can shape the course of history. So it is in recognition of his most powerful and exceptional example, and with a great sense of honor and powerful inspiration, that I join you in welcoming Julian Bond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good enough. Thank you. Thank you a great deal, Mr. Chancellor, for that kind introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm welcome. It goes without saying it's a great, great pleasure for me to be here today. I have to tell you, when I received the invitation, I was curious about why it had been extended. On the one hand, it could have been because I am the chairman of the board of the biggest, baddest, best civil rights organization in the United States. But then, but then, but then maybe, maybe that wasn't the reason. And then I thought perhaps it's because the people in Asheville knew about my close, intimate, personal relationship with the premier figure of the 20th century movement for civil rights the late Dr. Martin Luther King, and if they don't know about it, well, I'm gonna tell you about it right now. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people in this audience who have heard someone say, I was a student of Dr. King's. Well, you know, Dr. King only taught one time. <laughs> he only taught one class. There are only six people in the class. <laughs> I'm one of the six. <laughs> So I'm one of the six people in the whole universe who can honestly say I was a student of Martin Luther King's. Now, I wish I could tell you that I had taken extensive notes in class <laughs> and I had kept them until today, but uh, I didn't do that. I wish I could tell you I'd had the wit to bring a tape recorder to class. I tape recorded these pearls of wisdom that fell from the lips of this marvelous man, but uh, I didn't do that either. In fact, I'm not ashamed to say that I remember nothing that passed between teacher and student in the class, but, but I do remember one day, he and I were walking across the beautiful, beautiful Morehouse College campus, and I turned to him and I said, Doc, his friends called him Doc, I said, Doc, how are you doing? He said, Julian, I'm not doing well. He said, unemployment is high, racism is everywhere, segregation seems immovable, I feel awful, he said. I have a nightmare. I said, no, doc, turn that around. Try, I have a dream. And <laughs> well, <laughs> so I'm uh, happy to be here today. And I want to talk about a subject that many, many people think about and many, many people talk about but few people actually discuss, and that is the subject of race. For many people, the mere mention of the word, or even descriptions of the various races which make up America, for many people, it's divisive, setting one American against another, one neighbor against another. But the truth is, most Americans of different races are not neighbors. They tend to live and to work and to study apart. And they do so because of a long history. And without an understanding of that history of our past, 
there can be no common understanding of our present and no understanding of the role race has played and continues to play in all of our lives. It was 50 years ago this coming April that Martin Luther King Jr. preached his first sermon as the brand new pastor of Montgomery's Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He was 25 years old. One month later on May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court in Brown versus the Board of Education unanimously declared that segregated schools violated the Constitution's protection promise of equal protection. So as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of that landmark decision, it's easy to cast a cynical eye on the status of race relations in the United States and easy to minimize the significance of that decision. But that's a grave mistake. For Brown, by destroying segregation's legality, gave a nonviolent army the power to destroy segregation's morality as well. Thus, it's no coincidence that this year we also celebrate the 40th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the most sweeping civil rights legislation before or since, and our democracy's finest hour. So in 2004, as we celebrate these anniversaries, it will be a time to examine our present in relation to our past. And as we prepare to engage in national elections, 2004 will be a time for examination of our present in relation to our future. We look back on the years between Brown in 54 and the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act with some pride. Martin Luther King's first national address was at a 1957 prayer pilgrimage on the third anniversary of Brown at the Lincoln Memorial. In 1963 alone, the year that King, fresh from the battlefields of Birmingham, told the nation of his dream at the March on Washington, there were more than 10,000 anti-racist demonstrations. Now, King was the most famous and best known of the modern movement's personalities, but it was a people's movement. It produced leaders of its own. It relied not on the noted but the nameless, not on the famous but the faceless. It didn't wait for commands from afar to begin a campaign against injustice. It saw wrong and acted against it. It saw evil and brought it down. Those were the days when women and men of all races and creeds worked together in the cause of civil rights. Those were the days when good music was popular and when popular music was good. <laughs> Those were the days when the president picked the Supreme Court and not the other way around. Those were the days Those were the days when we had a war on poverty and not a war on the poor. And those were the days when patriotism was a reason for open-eyed disobedience, not an excuse for blind allegiance. Those were the days. Those were the days when the news media was really fair and balanced and, and not just stenographers for the powerful. But, but none of those days, none of those days was the good old days. In those days, the laws, the court, the schools, and almost every institution favored whites. This, according to John Hope Franklin, this was white supremacy. Martin Luther King described it in 1962. He said then, when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will, and drown your sisters and brothers at whim. When you've seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. When you've seen the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. When you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that's just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she's told that fun town is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, 
and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who's asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you're harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you're a Negro, living constantly on tiptoe stance, plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, never quite knowing what to expect next, when you're forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then, King concluded, then you will understand. And you will understand that most blacks then in the South could not vote. They attended inadequate segregated schools, if they went at all, and most attended only a few months each year. Most could not hope to gain an education beyond high school. Most worked as farmers or semi-skilled laborers. Few owned the land they farmed or even the homes in which they lived. This was a massive system of racial preferences, a vast affirmative action plan for whites, enforced by law and terror. It had one name and one aim, to crush the human development of a whole population. It began with slave catching in Africa, and it continues on to the present day. Only by acknowledging the name, the nature, and the scope of the problem can we measure the magnitude of our successes and the cost of our failures. When the Supreme Court announced in May of 55 that the white South could make haste slowly in dismantling segregated schools, I was a year older than Emmett Till. His death three months after the second Brown decision in 1955 was much more immediate to me than the court's decision had been. We were nearly the same age when he was murdered in Money, Mississippi for whistling at a white woman. His death and the black newspapers that came in my Pennsylvania home, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, had created a great vulnerability and fear of all things Southern in my teenage mind. And when my parents announced in 1957 that we were moving to Atlanta, I was filled with dread. Emmett Till's death had frightened me. But in the fall of 1957, a group of black teenagers encouraged me to put that fear aside. These young people, the nine young women and men who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, set a high standard of grace and courage under fire as they dared the mobs who surrounded their school. Here, I thought, is what I hope to be, if ever the chance comes my way. The chance to test to prove myself did come my way in 1960, as it came to thousands of other black high school and college students across the South. First through the sit-ins, then in the Freedom Rides, then in the voter registration and political organizing drives in the rural South, we joined an old movement against white supremacy that had deep, strong roots. For many of us, however, it was the recent Brown decisions that had created the opportunity for young people to play an active role, to seize and share leadership in the movement for social justice. Brown was the movement's greatest legal victory. It challenged the legal status of black Americans and ironically made challenges to the established movement's narrow reliance on legal action more possible. As Richard Kluger has written, not until the Supreme Court acted in 1954 did the nation acknowledge it had been blaming the black man for what it had done to him. His sentence to second-class citizenship had been commuted. The quest for meaningful equality, equality in fact as well as in law, had begun. I believe in an integrated America, integrated jobs, homes, and schools. I believe in it enough to have spent my life in its elusive pursuit. I think it a legal, moral, and political imperative for America a matter of elemental justice, simple right waged against historical wrong. Not only have I spent most of my life in this cause, in 1947, when I was seven years old, I was plaintiff in a lawsuit in rural Pennsylvania against segregated school. The suit never came to trial. The school board had segregated students by giving students achievement tests, which all blacks failed and all whites passed. But when the two big, dumb sons of the local white political boss failed the test, they closed the black school, and all of the Lincoln University Village's children went to a one-room school together. Last fall, I visited Berea College in Kentucky, opened by abolitionists as an integrated school in 1855. It was closed by the Civil War, but opened again in 1866 with 187 students. 
96 blacks, and 91 whites. It dared to provide a rare commodity in the former slave states, an education open to all, blacks and whites, women and men. One of these early students was my grandfather, James Bond. <laughs> like, like many others, like many others, I'm the grandson of a slave. My grandfather was born in 1863 in Kentucky. Freedom didn't come for him until the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865. He and his mother were property, like a horse or a chair. As a young girl, she'd been given away as a wedding present to a new bride. And when that bride became pregnant, her husband, that's my great-grandmother's owner and master, exercised his right to take his wife's slave as his mistress. That union produced two children, one of them my grandfather. At age 15, barely able to read or write, he hitched his tuition, a steer, to a rope and walked 100 miles across Kentucky to Berea College and the college took him in. My grandfather belonged to a transcendent generation of black Americans, a generation born into slavery, freed by the Civil War, determined to make their way as free women and men. From Berea, he studied for the ministry, married, had six children, one of them my father, Horace Mann Bond. My father graduated from Pennsylvania's Lincoln University, earned a doctorate in education from the University of Chicago. For him, too, education was a means to a larger end, the uplift of his people and the salvation of his race. How fitting then that he would be asked to help the NAACP in its legal campaign against segregation, the campaign that culminated in Brown versus the Board of Education. There can be no mistake. Those 50 years since Brown have seen the fortunes of black Americans advance and retreat, but the decision is always cause for sober celebration, not for impotent dismay. We celebrate the brilliant legal minds who were the architects of Brown v. Board, we celebrate the brave families who were its plaintiffs, and we celebrate the legal principle that remains its enduring legacy, that in the words of Chief Justice Earl Warren, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. The quest for meaningful equality, political and economic equity, remains unfulfilled today, but that's no indictment of past efforts, it's testament to our challenge. When my grandfather graduated from Berea in 1892, the college asked him to deliver the commencement address. He said then, the pessimist from his corner looks out on the world of wickedness and sin, and blinded by all that is good or hopeful in the condition and the progress of the human race, bewails the present state of affairs and predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud he beholds a destructive storm, in every flash of lightning an omen of evil, and in every shadow that falls across his path, a lurking foe. He forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope, that the lightning purifies the atmosphere, that shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth, and that hardships and adversity nerve the race, as the individual, for greater efforts and grander victories. Greater efforts, and grander victories. That was the promise made by the generation born in slavery more than 140 years ago. That was the promise made by the generation that won the great world war for democracy almost six decades ago. That was the promise made by those who brought democracy to America's darkest corners four decades ago, and that is the promise we must all seek to honor today. We meet as our nation is engaged in an unwise war of occupation in the Persian Gulf, War without reason or necessity. War whose primary rationale has now morphed from weapons of mass destruction to weapons of mass destruction related program activities. <laughs> the, the NAACP opposed unilateral war against Iraq, but we are as one with all Americans in supporting our fighting forces. We commend the bravery and sacrifice of our women and men in uniform. We pray for a swift return of our fighting forces to America's shores and to just and lasting peace at home and abroad. When Martin King spoke out against America's war in Vietnam in 1965, 
He said he was revolted at the hypocrisy of America's claims for freedom overseas when blacks enjoyed few freedoms here. War abroad, he said, stole from Americans at home. The pursuit of widened war, he said, has narrowed domestic welfare programs, making the poor, white and Negro, bear the heaviest burdens at the front and at home. How sadly true those words ring today. We know America's twin towers, freedom and justice, are still standing. It's our job to keep upright what others would weaken and destroy. We know America strongest when she is just, and she is fiercest when her people are free. Less than a week after the September 11th attacks, President George W. Bush went to the Washington Islamic Center. Standing in his stockinged feet, the president vowed to prevent hate crimes and discrimination against Arabs and Muslims in the wake of these attacks. And he renewed this vow on the first anniversary of 9-11. The president's two stated goals, retaliation against terrorists abroad, promotion of tolerance here at home, are reminiscent of the double V campaign waged by blacks during World War II. It then symbolized victory against fascism abroad, victory against racism here at home. With the events of September 11th, we realize we've not yet achieved either victory, not yet against tyranny abroad, not yet against racism here at home. Just as this enemy, terrorism, is more difficult to identify and punish, so is discrimination a much more elusive target today. No more do signs read white and colored. The law now requires the voters booth and schoolhouse door to swing open for everyone. No longer are they closed to those whose skins are black. But despite impressive increases in the number of black people holding public office, despite our ability to sit, eat, ride, vote, go to school in places that used to bar black faces, in some important ways, non-white Americans face problems more difficult to attack now than in all the years that went before. The NAACP, whose board I chair, has always been nonpartisan, but that doesn't mean we're non-critical. The passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 marked the beginning of the dependence of the Republican Party on the politics of racial division to win elections and gain power. By playing the race card in election after election, they've appealed to the dark underside of American culture, to that small minority of Americans who reject democracy and equality. They preach racial neutrality and they practice racial division. They celebrate Dr. King and they misuse his message. Their idea of reparations is to give war criminal Jefferson Davis a pardon. Their idea of equal rights is the American and Confederate flag flying side by side. Their idea of compassion is to ask the guest at the millionaire's banquet if they want an extra helping or a second dessert. And they've tried to patch the leaky economy and every other domestic problem with duct tape and plastic sheets. They draw some of their most rabid supporters from the Taliban wing of American politics. And what about the other party? Too often they're not in opposition, they're an amen corner. With some notable exceptions, they've been absent without leave from this battle for America's soul. When one party is shameless, the other party can't afford to be spineless. Now the economic... The economic imbalances we face not only mean difficult times for many, they also undermine democratic values. The danger is that plutocracy will prevail over democracy, that the free market will ride roughshod over the free citizen. The reason for the current deficit and the vanished surplus can be placed scarily on the tax giveaway to the rich. To make up for just the initial tax cuts, we'd have to cut spending by $5 billion five days a week for over a year. That was the whole point. To further enrich the already wealthy and to starve the government, making it unable to meet human needs, signing a death warrant for social programs for decades and decades yet to come. We have a president who talks like a populist and governs for the privileged. We have an attorney general who's a cross between J. Edgar Hoover and Jerry Falwell. And... And we have a Senate Majority Leader 
who has voted consistently against labor rights, against civil rights, and against women's rights, and he's the one who replaced the bad guy. <laughs> Only one senator, Russell Feingold of Wisconsin, voted against the first hastily prepared and ill-considered terrorism measure proposed after September 11th. He explained his vote this way. If we lived in a country that allowed the police to search our home at any time for any reason, if we lived in a country that allowed the government to open your mail, eavesdrop on our phone conversations, or intercept your email communications, if we lived in a country that allowed the government to hold people indefinitely in jail based on what they write or think, or based on mere suspicion that they are up to no good, then the government would no doubt discover and arrest more terrorists. But that probably would not be a country in which we would want to live. Nor do we want to live in a country that permits infiltration and surveillance of religious and political organizations. Yet the new FBI guidelines proposed by J. Edgar Ashcroft do just that. <laughs> now just as we remember J. Edgar Hoover, we remember his counterintelligence program. It was called COINTEL Pro. And whose intelligence was it they wanted to counter? In a program called Racial Matters, the FBI tried to disrupt the civil rights movement. They tried to smear Dr. King. They not only wanted him discredited, they wanted him dead. They threatened him with the release of damaging information if he did not take his own life. We thought we'd put a stop to Hoover's program of spies and lies in the 1970s after these abuses were discovered. Now, under the guise of fighting terrorism, the FBI is going back to spying on law-abiding citizens. War and fear often cause hasty mistakes, costly both in economic and in human terms. We need to remember what we are fighting for. In the summer of 1918, one of the NAACP's founders, on the eve of America's entry into World War I, urged black Americans to forget our special grievances close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our fellow citizens and the allied nations fighting for democracy. The criticism he faced then was immediate and loud. He quickly reversed his position and he realized then as we must now that calls for a retreat from our rights are always wrong. He understood then as we must now that when wars are fought to save democracy, the first casualty is usually democracy itself. That's why we have to be vigilant against the steady erosion of American values and the basic rights we hold dear. We ought to remember the words of Ohio Senator Robert Taft, and I never thought I'd be quoting Robert Taft. <laughs> we ought to remember the words of Senator Robert Taft, who said two weeks before Pearl Harbor, two weeks after Pearl Harbor had been attacked, I believe, he said, there can be no doubt that criticism in time of war is essential to the maintenance of any kind of democratic government. And we ought to remember the words of President Theodore Roosevelt, who said in 1918, to announce there must be no criticism of the president or to stand by the president right or wrong is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonous to the American public. The FBI, the CIA, <laughs> the FBI and the CIA kept files on me in the 1960s they may be keeping files on me today. But while they were watching and following and photographing and wiretapping those of us working nonviolently in the freedom movement, a wave of white terrorism was sweeping across the South without challenge. It has taken 40 years and more to bring a pitiful few of those terrorists to justice. And it's taken 40 years and more to put in place a framework for civil rights enforcement, a framework now threatened on several fronts. The administration's judicial nominees are hostile to the basic principles of civil rights law and civil rights enforcement. They oppose the core constitutional principle of one person, one vote. They've supported federal funding for racially discriminatory schools. Among those staffing the voting rights sections of the Justice Department is the lawyer who ran the purge of Florida's voting rolls before the 2000 elections. Another is a former senior counsel for the misnamed Center for Equal Opportunity an organization founded to fight laws requiring racial justice in America. Organizations dedicated to overturning the gains of civil rights movement are now dictating public policy. They will not rest until white preferences are restored. Their very names are fraudulent and their aims are frightening. They have stolen our vocabulary and they want to steal the just spoils of our righteous war. They are sophisticated and well-funded 
and over the past decade they've won several victories in the plot to dismantle justice and fair play. For more than a decade they've waged ideological war against moderation in the federal judiciary, and then they've squealed the loudest when the extremists they support are turned away. Now they've ascended to unprecedented positions of power in the federal government. They want to make any consideration of race illegal and thereby do away with our rights and much of the legacy of the civil rights movement, including affirmative action. They say they believe in a colorblind America where race doesn't count. Sadly, in America, equal opportunity is color-coded. What they really want is a color-free America, and they think they'll get there by not counting race. Affirmative action was created to fight what Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor called the unhappy persistence of both the practice and the lingering effects of racial discrimination. Affirmative action has been under attack not because it has failed, but because it has succeeded. It created... It created the sizable middle class that now constitutes one-third of all black Americans. In the late 1960s, the wages of black women in the textile industry tripled. From 1970 to 1990, the number of black police officers, lawyers, and doctors doubled. Black electricians and college students tripled. Black bank tellers more than quadrupled. The opponents keep telling us that affirmative action carries with it a stigma which attaches to all black people as if none of us ever felt any stigma before the words affirmative action were ever spoken. Why don't they ever make this argument about the millions of whites who got into Harvard or Yale because dad was an alumnus? Or, or, or what about those who got a good job because dad was president of the company or president of the United States? You never. You never, never see these people walking around, heads held low, moaning that everybody in the executive washroom is whispering about how they got their job. <laughs> Most of our elite professions have long been the near exclusive preserve of white men. I seriously doubt if a single one of those men is suffering low self-esteem <laughs> because he knows, everybody knows, that his race and his gender helped him win his job. Look at it this way. It's the fourth quarter in a football game between the white team and the black team. The white team is ahead 145 to three. The white team owns the ball, the uniforms, the field, the goalpost, and the referees. All of a sudden, the white quarterback, who feels badly about things that happened before he got in the game, turns to the black team and says, hey fellas, can't we just play fair? Of course. Playing fair in this game is doublespeak for freezing the status quo in place, permanently fixing inequality as part of the American scene. Affirmative action is not about preferential treatment for blacks. Rather, it's about removing the racial preferences whites have received for centuries, giving equal treatment to people denied equality in the past. Without it, both white and blue collars around black necks would begin to shrink with a huge depressive effect on black education, income, health, and home ownership. Last term, the Supreme Court upheld the legality of affirmative action in two cases from the University of Michigan. In doing so, the court gave legal sanction to what we knew to be morally, socially, and educationally correct. As quiet as it's kept by those who call themselves colorblind in his name, Dr. King supported affirmative action. He said in 1963, it's impossible to create a formula for the future, which does not take into account that society has been doing something special against the Negro for hundreds of years. How then can he be absorbed into the mainstream of American life if we do not do something special for him now in order to balance the equation and equip him to compete on a just and equal basis? President Bush chose Dr. King's birthday this year to unilaterally elevate reactionary Charles Pickering to the federal appeals bench his hostility to civil rights and his leniency to cross burners notwithstanding. And President Bush chose Dr. King's birthday last year to announce that even though he admits that society continues to do something special against minorities, his administration won't do anything special for them. He opposed Michigan's efforts to promote diversity among its student body. That is so ironic. 
After all, the Bush family has enjoyed three generations of preferences at Yale University. Preferences for the first daughter, for her father before her, and for his grandfather before him. Now, the Bush administration likes to use Secretary of State Colin Powell and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice as human shields against any criticism of their record on civil rights. After all, After all, the president's fond of saying, his administration is more diverse than any in history, except for the one just before it. <laughs> but the day after, the day after the administration filed its brief in the Michigan case, Ms. Rice issued a rare statement on a domestic issue. She said it's appropriate to use race as one factor among others in achieving a diverse student body. And she's acknowledged that affirmative action was responsible for her employment at Stanford University. Secretary Powell, for his part, has long been an outspoken supporter of affirmative action and specifically said he hoped the University of Michigan would prevail in court. The civil war that freed my grandfather was fought over whether blacks and whites shared a common humanity. Less than 10 years after it ended, the nation chose sides with the losers and agreed to continue black repression for almost 100 years. The freed slaves found their former masters once again controlled their fate. American slavery was a human horror of staggering dimensions, a crime against humanity. The profits it produced endowed great fortunes and enriched generations, and its dreadful legacy embraces us all today. As John Hope Franklin writes, all whites benefited from American slavery. All blacks had no rights they could claim their own. All whites, including the vast majority who own no slaves, were not only encouraged but authorized to exercise dominion over all slaves, thereby adding to the system of control. Even poor whites, Dr. Franklin says, benefited from the legal advantage they enjoyed over all blacks, as well as from the psychological advantage of having a group beneath them. Most living Americans, he said, do have a connection with slavery. They have inherited the preferential advantage if they are white, or the loathsome disadvantage if they are black, and these positions are virtually as alive today as they were in the 19th century. Now, 246 years of slavery were followed by 100 years of state-sanctioned discrimination, reinforced by public and private terror, ending only after a major struggle in 1965. Thus, it has been a short 39 years since all black Americans have been allowed to exercise the full rights of citizens. Only 39 years since legal segregation was ended nationwide. Only 39 years since the right to register and vote was universally guaranteed. Only 39 years since the protections of the law and the Constitution were officially extended to all. And now, some are telling us those 39 years have been enough. To believe that is the victory of hope over experience. To believe that is the victory of self-delusion over common sense. The removal over the decades of the 1960s of the more blatant forms of American apartheid has made it too easy for too many to believe that all forms of discrimination have disappeared. Opinion polls reveal that a majority of whites think racial discrimination is no longer an impediment for people of color. In one study, 75% of whites said blacks face no discrimination in obtaining jobs or housing, even as such discrimination daily becomes more severe. Polls show most white Americans think equal education opportunity exists right now, even as our schools are becoming more, not less, segregated across the country. The successful strategies of the modern movement for civil rights were litigation, organization, mobilization, and coalition all aimed at creating a national constituency for civil rights. That movement marched and picketed and protested against state-sanctioned segregation and it brought that system crashing to its knees. Today's times require no less and, in fact, insist on more. Now we find ourselves refighting old battles we thought we'd already won, facing new problems we've barely begun to acknowledge, but we ought to take heart. If there's more to be done, we have more to do it, do it with much more than those who came before us and who brought us along this far. As a nation, we have a history of aggressive self-help and volunteerism in church and civic club and neighborhood association, providing scholarships, helping the needy, 
promoting social service, but volunteering for social service does little to change the status quo. Creating change requires challenging power. It's never enough just to ignore evil. It's never enough just to do good. It's never enough just to feed the hungry or house the homeless, as commendable as these acts are. It may be helpful to think about our common task in this way. Two men are sitting beside a river and to their great surprise, they see a baby come floating by. They jump in and save the child and to their horror, another baby comes down the stream. They jump in the water a second time and when that baby's rescued, to their great surprise, a third baby comes floating by. One man jumps in the water the third time and the other man begins to run upstream. Come back, says the man in the water, we've got to save this child. You save it, says the running man. I'm going to find out who's throwing babies in the water and I'm going to make him stop. <laughs> now, I recently heard... I recently heard Professor Lonnie Guineer say that racial minorities are like the canaries that miners used to carry to warn them when the underground air was becoming too toxic to breathe. But too many people today want to put gas masks on the canaries instead of taking the poison out of the air. Too many people want to put life preservers on the babies instead of stopping them from being thrown in a dangerous, treacherous flood. We have a long and honorable tradition of social justice in this country. It still sends forth the message that when we act together, we can overcome. And we have a revitalized NAACP prepared for the challenges that lie ahead. We have no permanent friends. We have no permanent enemies, just permanent interest and those interests are justice and freedom. It is, it is a serious mistake, both tactical and moral, to believe this is a fight that must be or should be waged by black Americans alone. That has never been so in centuries past. It ought not be so in the century unfolding now. Black, yellow, red, white, all are needed in this fight, all of us implicated in the continuation of inequality, it will require our common effort to bring it to an end. Our agenda for this new century must include continuing to litigate, to organize, to mobilize, forming coalitions of the caring and concern, joining ranks against the comfortable, the callous, and the smug. It must include fighting discrimination wherever it raises its ugly head, in the halls of government and corporate suites or in the streets ensuring every citizen registers and votes, and guaranteeing the irregularities, suppression, nullification, and outright theft of black votes that occurred in 2000 never, 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 ever happens again. These votes, <laughs> these votes can be a reward for advancing justice, or they can be punishment for betrayal. We're tired of fattening frogs for snakes. We want to demand fair treatment for people with HIV and AIDS, especially for people of color. This disease strikes African-American women more than any other group. It doesn't happen to other people, it happens to us. And we want to demand that criminal justice cease being an oxymoron. We know race, more than any other factor, determines who's arrested, who's tried, for what crime, who receives what length of sentence, who receives the ultimate punishment, and we are determined that we are going to see it stop. And, and we demand that the unceasing open season on our people by police come to a stop and that the criminals in uniform be punished. And, and we want to ensure that our children in inner city and suburban and rural schools receive the best education, an education that prepares them for the century just begun. There's much, much more, none of it easy work, but we've never wished our way to freedom. Instead, we've always worked our way. By the year 2050, blacks and Hispanics together will be 40% of the nation's population. Wherever there are others who share our condition and concerns, we must make common cause with them. In the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, we believe colored people come in all colors. Anybody who shares our values is more than welcome. The growth in immigration, the emergence of new and vibrant populations of people of color, holds out great promise and great peril. The promise is that the coalition for justice will grow larger and stronger 
as new allies join the fight. The peril comes from <coughs> real fears that our common foes will find ways to separate and divide us. It doesn't make sense if blacks and Latinos fight over which of us has the smallest amount of power. Together, we can constitute a mighty force for change. Racial justice, economic equality, world peace, these were the themes that occupied Dr. King's life. They ought to occupy ours today. We live in a small, small world. If we could squeeze the world's population into a village of only 100 people, keeping all the existing ratios the same, the world would look like this. There'd be 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 from the Western Hemisphere, North and South, and eight Africans. 52 of the 100 would be female. 70 would be non-white. 70 would not be Christians. Six of the 100 people would own 59% of all the wealth in the world, and all six would be from the United States. 80 of the 100 would live in substandard housing. 70 would be unable to read and write. 50 would suffer from malnutrition. One would own a computer. One would have a college education. If we look at the world in this way, we're reminded of our mutual dependence and our mutual responsibilities. We know our world, our lives changed on September 11th. We really don't know by how much just yet, but we know we have a job to do here at home as much as abroad. When I first started working four decades ago, there were five workers paying in the national retirement system for every retiree. Of course, there's no way I could know who my five were, but there's a good chance their names would be Carl, Ralph, Bob, Steve, and Bill. When I retire, there are gonna be three workers paying in the retirement system for every retiree, and there's a good chance their names will be Tamika, Maria, and Jose. And I'm here to tell you that you'd better be sure that Tamika, Maria, and Jose have the best schools, the best healthcare, the best jobs, and the strongest protection against discrimination they possibly can. Thank you. How do you respond to such a powerful address? What do you say in, 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 in reaction to a living figure of history? <laughs> Mr. Bond, these are my neighbors. <laughs> uh, to, the, to, the, to my neighbors, to the community residents, I invite you to respond. Uh, it's so good to see my friends. It's, it's so good. But first, to the students, just one piece of advice. You, you all know I'm a professor. That's what I do. All right. When you ask your questions, and this is a question and answer period to my students, now listen. Think of Mr. Bond as a book. It's up to you to turn the page. Make him explain what he said. Ask him to take you to another chapter. For my neighbors, I'm going to ask you to give these students a chance to ask those questions, but I invite you to join also. I'll moderate for, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, and then there will be a reception in the lobby. Is that good, Ms. McQueen? Welcome. Ms. McQueen? Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Question? Sean, how did I know that? Sean, come stand up, stand up. And I'll try to repeat it so that you can hear. <laughs> Mr. Bond, what role can we as young college students play 
in helping to continue to create the, uh, the just spoils of a righteous war. The, the question is what role can college students or young people play in this struggle? Well, there have been young people as an important part of the struggle since the struggle began. Um, and they've always played significant roles in a variety of ways. The nice thing, or one of the nice things about the fight for justice is that there isn't one way. There's never been one way. You know, wherever I go, somebody always says, what's the one thing? Because everybody wants to know what the one thing is. But there is no one thing and there is no one way so that people who are young and who have these several attributes, youth, energy, vigor, curiosity, they haven't become as cynical as their parents have. They're still open to change. They're eager. They want to make their mark. There are literally dozens of organizations and groups that are crying out for eager young volunteers to join in them. And they range from my own, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I know some people out here, probably your membership has elapsed. And if you want to sign up again, go to NAACP.org and we take credit cards or you can print out a form and you can send in a check. But there's the NAACP and if you don't know where your NAACP is, you click on North Carolina, stand up. And if you, uh, if you want, if, if, you're not, if you're not computer literate, you can just go right there and he'll be glad to accommodate you. And they have a youth chapter too. And uh, so there are just hundreds and hundreds of opportunities for young people to serve in this fight in some way. In this struggle, not everyone has to do the same thing. In fact, it's probably advisable that everyone not do the same thing. Because as uh, that old philosopher, Chairman Mao, once said, let a thousand flowers bloom. And that's what is badly needed in this movement, for a thousand flowers to bloom. So there's, there's much space and there's much desire in this movement to attract young people and to give young people real responsibility and real leadership. Yes, most important thing, because I, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say, young people, that you young people, you, oh, I used to hate that, you young people, <laughs> but now I can do it. <laughs> you, young, you young people, of all the demographics in America, you young people have the worst record of registering and voting of any group of people in the United States. So that means when elections are being decided, the concerns you have are not being listened to because you're not speaking in the most important way people can speak in political contests, and that's through casting their votes. And you can register online. You can register online. You can register in your home state online, I believe. And there's no reason why you should not be registered to vote. I'm just wondering, uh, I said the NAACP is nonpartisan. How many of you are South Carolinians? A few. And of the South Carolinians, how many of you voted in the recent primary? Is it too far away? <laughs> Don't they have absentee ballots in South Carolina? So there's no excuse for this. This is the simplest of citizenship tasks and the easiest of those tasks to perform. And there's no reason why anyone old enough, eligible enough, ought not be registered to vote. I'll be in it. I'll be in it. Um, it's interesting for me that uh, just in the past couple of years, since September 11th, folks have become more interested in civil liberties. I remember becoming interested in civil liberty, civil liberties, under the Reagantarians back in the 80s when they started tearing up the Fourth Amendment with under the, the war on drugs. Um, and it's obvious it's a it's a it's a speech it's a it's a course a series of courses in itself why we have 2.3 million people in our in, imprisoned in America some six million I believe under some sort of uh, probation uh, etc judicial oversight. And I'm wondering if what it would be like, you, you, what your vision as a, an attorney, a, a, a civil rights uh, attorney, what it would be like if we invested 
half of our judicial resources and law enforcement resources into looking at why there's some 250 billion to 500 billion dollars in money laundering dollars, drugs, arms trading dollars going through US banks. If we invested half of the effort that we spend in pulling people in off the streets for having a little bit of uh, recreational drugs, what the world might look like in the United States after. Well, of that course, happens. if we had a more even handed policy toward people who are addicted, and addiction, as some of you know, addiction is an illness. And if someone has tuberculosis or cancer, the cure is not to put them in prison because it's not likely that the illness will improve in that setting. It's likely to worsen. And so if we took the approach that addiction is an illness, which most, I think, believe it is, then there'd be first many, many fewer people in prison. We'd be spending much less money on incarceration and law enforcement, and we'd be in a very different way. And as the question was being asked, I thought about something else, mindful that Eric Rudolph was arrested not far away from here. I have a good friend who is his lawyer, and she, before that, represented Susan Smith. And before that, she represented or after that, she represented Theodore Kaczynski. Now, what do we think about these three people? Two of them convicted of crime, one of them charged with serious crime. I'll tell you what, I think that I wanted to make sure that each of them had every possible legal protection he or she could have. Because if you're not willing to give it to them, when my time comes around, I'm afraid I won't get it either. And so we test ourselves. We test ourselves. We test ourselves on how we treat the worst people in society, how we treat the biggest offenders in society. And if we don't give them the protections they require and demand, then we're weakening them for all the rest of us. I saw on more, this morning looking at TV the discovery of the body of this little girl, the, the father of a child who had been kidnapped and stolen and murdered years and years ago, and quite naturally, he's angry. Angry at the criminal justice system who let the killer of his child out of prison prematurely and allowed him to destroy this little precious life. But, you know, we can't allow that understandable emotion and anger to guide these kinds of decisions. We can't allow that to happen as much as our heart bleeds and our sympathies go out to these families devastated in this awful, awful way. So it's not just a matter of rollbacks in certain kinds of civil liberties for certain kinds of people. We've got to be vigilant and protect civil liberties for every single person. Because when one person is denied, we're all denied. And you know, we like to think, well, they're bad people, I'm a good person. It's not going to happen to me. Why should I worry? You never know. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, I think I'll speak for everyone in the room when saying uh, we love everything you have to say very much in this liberal microcosm of America. Anyways. Who would you like to see on the Democratic ticket for the election, and why? And also, um, I also kind of wanted to know what your organization plans to do during the election, hopefully not just endorsing a candidate, but maybe what, what, you, what actions? Let me tell you what we're not going to do, okay? <laughs> Never in our history, we were formed in 1909. Never in our history have we endorsed a candidate for public office. Never in our history have we endorsed a political party. And we don't intend to begin endorsing parties or candidates today. We are a nonpartisan organization, no matter what the other people say. Uh, we're rigidly nonpartisan. We're nonpartisan by reason of the tax exemption the government has given us. And we're not about to risk that tax exemption to endorse John Smith or Mary Jones or anybody else for public office. Uh, and we have sanctions against people in our organization who are in leadership positions who do endorse candidates, we have sanctions against them. 
they step over that line, they're going to face some kind of sanction. But I tell you what we are going to do, and what we do every election year. We're going to, we have 2,200 branches scattered around the United States, about 1,700 adult branches, 500 youth branches. And each of them is charged to make a major part of their agenda in these election years, the registering of all the unregistered voters in their community they can possibly register to vote. You know, about 50% of the people, it's not just 50% of the people who are registered don't vote, it's 50% of the people aren't registered at all. It's not even a decision for them. So there's this enormous pool of people out there who are not registered to vote, who if they were would be in a position to. So after registering them, then we engage in a process of educating them since 1914. We have been putting out a report card on Congress. We just released our report card on this Congress two weeks ago. You can find it at NAACP.org. Find out how your member of Congress voted on issues the NAACP thinks is important, whether he or she got an A, B, C, D, or F. Uh, so we're going to spread that around so people in our organization know about these voting records. And then as the election approaches, we're going to begin to build up the Get Out to Vote campaign. Of course, that's the most important part of the whole process, is making sure everybody registered turns out and votes. In some ways, it's the most difficult part of the process because it's the most labor intensive. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, modern ways to bring people to the polls, television among them big TV ads, Joe Blow is the better candidate, Joe Smith is no good, but of course, those cost millions and millions of dollars, and every time you say Joe's no good, you have the effect of depressing the electorate, depressing the electorate by people who just can't stand this kind of negativity in politics and who decide, I'll just leave that alone. The best way is by knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, we're voting tomorrow, 10 o'clock, I'll come by and pick you up. And so we're lucky that we have this enormous grassroots membership of 750,000 people who are ready and eager to do that, and we're going to unleash this army. So that's what we're going to do in this election year. Could we look for two more questions and uh, look towards the reception? I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Oh, look. Where, where, where? <laughs> can I hear you? Can I, can I, can I please talk? This is, this is one of many, many questions on which the NAACP has no opinion. But let me tell you what my opinion is. The question is what I think about President Bush's uh, implied threat to support an amendment describing marriage as a union between a man and a woman. And I answered that the NAACP has taken no position on this question. We are not for it, we're not against it, we have no position on it. And what I'm gonna tell you right now is my position. If this amendment, and they just passed one in uh, Ohio, if this amendment passed, this would be the first time we'd have amended the Constitution to discriminate against a class of people. The very first time we've amended the Constitution to discriminate against a class of people. Now, people tell me marriage is for the purpose of procreation. I got married 15 years ago. Friends are not going to be any children. <laughs> okay? I'm telling you, there's not going to be any children from this marriage. So that's obviously not what marriage is for, for everyone. Marriage is for two people who want the state to recognize their union and to extend to them the benefits the state extends to others similarly situated. Now, you know, in my view, I, I know many people of faith, religious people, have objections to this. But you know, the, the Bible isn't always instructive. 
Isn't there a passage in the Bible that says women undergoing their menstrual cycle ought to be stoned to death? Is there anybody who believes that here? At any rate, um, <laughs> Don't ask. at any rate, this is a civil right. The Massachusetts Supreme Court just early this week reaffirmed this is a civil right. And if you have religious objections against it, I'd suggest you not do it. Okay? Uh, my question to you is, uh, explain how Dr. King's March on, March on Washington speech affected you personally. Well, I was at the March on Washington. Um, I was the publicity director of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and each of the publicity directors of each of the organizations sponsoring the march had different responsibilities. The man from the NAACP, that was the oldest organization, his responsibility was to walk around issuing pronouncements. That's pretty much what he did. His name was Henry Lee Moon, a distinguished guy. He walked around, you know, delivering pronouncements. And it came down a tier, and I was at the bottom of that tier. And my job was giving Coca-Colas to the movie stars. <laughs> and I can remember handing Sammy Davis Jr. a Coca-Cola, and he said, thanks, kid. <laughs> so that, that's one of my big memories of the March on Washington. But I had... Uh, I had, you know, people who had heard Dr. King speak several times had heard some of those phrases before. Um, the, till justice rolls, those lines from Amos, till justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, we'd heard those lines before, but I don't think any of us who'd heard him speak a dozen times or more had ever heard him as good on point as he was that day. Let me recommend to you a great, great book, which I think, I'm not sure, is called The Speech. It's published uh, last year. And what it does is, in two separate columns, runs the written text of King's speech and the spoken text of King's speech. And the remarkable thing is that there are large periods when this side is blank, when he's left the printed page. And when you see that video again, and believe me, you'll see it again, if you notice he begins, he's speaking kind of quick, he's looking down at his notes, he's picking up his paper, he's doing like this, and so on and so on. And after a while, he just, he gets, he knows the crowd is with him, and he's into it, and out of his memory, he begins to call, call up these incredible phrases that you'd swear had been thought about and written down and said, no, I won't say that, I think I'll say this, or cross that out, and so on. So it's just a remarkable performance by the man who surely was the premier orator of the 20th century in the United States, and whose genius was his ability to say the same thing to white people and to black people. You know, most people, myself included, if this audience was all black, I would have given the same speech but would have been a different speech. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that that's because I'm partial to anybody, it's just different, because you get a different kind of response. A lot of amens, a lot of that's right, a lot of tell it brother, a lot of this, a lot of that. You get a different response. And the response spurs the speaker. And uh, when I heard that, yes, there you go. When I, when I heard that, uh, and you know, these speakers, don't get me started here, these speakers have all these different tricks. You know, Malcolm X used to say, can I have a minute more? And you know the people said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I just heard Jesse Jackson give a speech and he started saying something and people in the audience said, you know, what is that? And he said, now, watch me, watch me. And he said something else and people said, what is that all about? He said, watch where I'm going now, watch where I'm going. And finally he pulled it all together and everybody said, oh, we see where you're going. A marvelous thing. So anyway, um, I was tremendously moved by it. Uh, as I said, I'd heard him many times before. That's a true story that he did teach me in college. That's stuff about, I have a nightmare, that's not true. <laughs> but uh, I had never heard him speak so well, and I don't think he spoke as well in any other circumstance where I heard him after that. Uh, it was tremendously moving, and it was the perfect capstone of the day. 
you know, we've forgotten that other people made speeches that day, and many of them made wonderful, wonderful speeches. John Lewis, now a congressman, was chairman of SNCC, and he made a wonderful, wonderful speech, a fabulous speech. Uh, a. Philip Randolph made a great speech. Roy Wilkins made a great speech. Uh, everybody made a wonderful speech, but uh, that, was, that was the speech. And if I'm right about the title, go on a bookstore and buy this book. I think it's called The Speech, but uh, it's a great book. Mr. Bond, on, on behalf of the student body, we have just a token for oh. you. It's a windbreaker. <laughs> It later. This is uh, ceramic art. Ooh. Yeah, you'll like it. You'll like it. Thank you all very much.